Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're starting a brand new Let's Talk Lore series titled Liu Biao, the Governor of Jin, as we hope to cover Liu Biao's entire life, from his early fame as a renowned scholar to his later years as a regional power in the Jin province. Now, Liu Biao was born in 142 in a small county called Gouping within the Shanyang Commandery. A distant relative to the imperial clan, Liu Bao needs to go back 11 generations to trace his lineage back to Emperor Liu Qi, the sixth emperor of the Western Han Dynasty, roughly 300 years ago. By Liu Bao's time, his particular branch of the family no longer had any nobility titles, but were well off enough to afford Liu Bao to receive an excellent education growing up. And one of the teachers that Liu Bao would have in his teenage years would be a local scholar by the name of Wang Chang, who was recently promoted to become the administrator of the Nanyang Commandery after quite a lengthy political career both inside the imperial court and in different regional posts. At the time, Nanyang was a particularly difficult commandery to administer, as it was the hometown of Liu Xiu, the founding emperor of the Eastern Han Dynasty, so numerous notable gentry clans, including many branches of the imperial clan, share deep ties within Nanyang. And after decades of being well-connected at court, these gentry clans had grown not only rich through corruption, but also extremely unruly as they leaned on their political power to bully and exploit the commoners in Nanyang for personal gains and pleasure. When Wang Chang first arrived in Nanyang, he had tried to strictly punish all wrongdoers, but every time he would imprison these gentry clan members, the emperor would soon find a way to pardon them, as many of them were his relatives. Unable to go against the emperor directly, Wang Chang then attempted to crack down corruption, as he would issue a ruling that if your clan had embezzled more than 20 million, then you had this one chance to come clean and pay off a fine, or else he reserved the right to seize all your properties as a result of the corruption once the embezzlement crime is proven guilty. Soon enough, Wang Chang was able to finally nail one clan for embezzlement as he would not only seize all their properties but also tear down their estate and even cut down all the trees to make example for all to see. This ended up spooking many of the local gentry clans, who then decided to pay the fines and live more low-key to avoid the ire of Wang Chang. And to set example for all to follow, Wang Chang himself purposely only wore cheap clothing made of hemp, used a dated second-handed carriage as he traveled around, and ate simply and light for all his meals. His actions would have a long-term effect on Nanyang Commandery, but it did result in a debate with his pupil Liu Biao, who argued with his teacher that he was setting an unreasonable requirement for others to follow and that taking a more moderate position would have been more effective. Liu Biao even cited example of one of Confucius' student who ended up only wanting to appear saintly when pursuing the strictest definition of being a gentleman rather than embracing a more lax and approachable standard that all can follow. To this, Wang Chang only responded that people rarely get punished when living simply, and that only through setting the best example can you hope to change long-established habits of waste and vanity. Now, Wang Chang would eventually go on to become one of the three Grand Excellency positions for a short while until he would take the blame for a natural disaster and would be let go by the court after a particularly bad flood. He would die later that year at home due to old age. And it's worth noting here that Wang Chang's grandson, Wang Chan, would actually eventually become one of the famed Seven Talents of Jian'an within Cao Cao's court. But before that, Wang Chan actually went to the Jin province to look for a job under Liu Biao, who had been his grandfather's student. But Liu Biao at the time largely ignored him and only gave him a minor post. This was particularly sad because Wang Chan was quite a talented scholar and would eventually be referred to as the crown of the seven talents of Jian'an, on par with even the likes of Cao Zhi. But that's years in the future. For now, Liu Biao would grow up and in his 20s 
be classified with seven other renowned Yang scholars at the time and be nicknamed Ba Jun, similar to a modern day 30 under 30 list. But with this fame, Liu Bao got the chance to attend the Imperial School, or Tai Xue, inside the capital to farther his education. But unfortunately, the timing did not work in his favor, as in 168, when Liu Bao was 27, the second partisan incident occurred at court. While Liu Bao himself would not be involved directly, a fellow member of the Ba Jun in Zhang Jian was not only heavily involved, but also forced to flee into exile after being wanted by the eunuchs at court. The final result was that Liu Bao, through his association with the imperial school, and the students in support of the scholars, ended up being barred from ever being able to hold a court position. So even before Nobel had a chance to prove himself, he ended up on the government blacklist. And it would take until 184, after the Yellow Turban Rebellion, for the court to finally clear the names of those on this blacklist from the partisan incident, as Emperor Liu Hong felt the need to win back the support of the scholars and many of the gentry clans after the damage done by the widespread but short-lived Yellow Turban Rebellion. At this time, Nobel, who was already 43 years old, was recruited by Grand General He Jin to work as an assistant before being elevated to become one of the five colonels for the Northern Army, which was in charge of protecting the capital. Nobel would remain stagnant in this position until the year 190, meaning that he would have lived through He Jin's assassination and Dong Zhuo's takeover while serving as the colonel in the Northern Army, which was He Jin's personal unit until Dong Zhuo seized it after seizing control of the capital. So technically, Liu Bao was an officer of Dong Zhuo, which is why when Sun Jian murdered the prefect of the Jin province in Wang Rui on his march north to join Yuan Shu and the coalition against Dong Zhuo, Dong Zhuo would respond by promoting Liu Bao to take over as the new prefect of the Jin province. Now this was far from an envious job, as not only were there bandits running amok all across the southern commanderies of the Jin province, coalition member Yuan Shu was garrisoned in Nanyang commandery, a rebel named Su Dai took control of the Changsha commandery and named himself as the new administrator there, while another rebel by the name of Bei Yu took control of the Huarong county, and none of them wanted Liu Bao to make it to his new post inside the Jin province alive. So in order to assume his new post, Liu Bao decided to abandon his convoy as the official government convoy was too big of a target as he would end up disguising himself as just a lone traveler and eventually sneak his way into the city of Yicheng, which is located just southeast of Xiangyang. Here, Liu Bao would make contact with two influential local gentry clans in the Kuai clan and the Tsai clan. The brothers Kuai Liang and Kuai Yue would represent the Kuai clan, while Tsai Mao represented the Tsai clan, as the three of them became close advisors to Liu Biao. Liu Biao's first order of business was to contend with the numerous rebel groups in the south to restore order and establish some sort of control in the Jin province. As he asked the Kuai brothers for advice, Kuai Liang first explained that most of the rebel groups are clan-based, as given the weakening of the central government, many of the larger clans in different rural areas throughout the Jin province started to band together and form militias. Over time, these clan-based militia groups replaced the local governments, either because the local government was too corrupt or too weak. Now, having tasted power and autonomy for themselves, it is difficult to bring them back into the fold, as the core issue in the Jin province and throughout China at this time is that the central government has lost credibility with the people. And to root out this problem for good, Kuai Liang suggested to Liu Bao that he must rebuild that accountability by providing stability and establishing fair policies. Kuai Yue then chimed in and stated that while this was a great long-term solution, in the short term, a bit of strategy is all they needed. Yuan Shu, Su Dai, Bei Yu, and all the clan militias all have their weaknesses. First, we can tackle the clan militia problem by exploiting their greed. Our plan would be simple. 
using your new post as bait, we will announce your arrival in the Jin province and host a large feast. Invitations will be sent out to all the clan militia leaders, promising them official government posts as bribes. Once they would arrive here to attend the feast, my well-trained house guests will be ready to execute them. Then with the support of my clan, the Thai clan, and the Huang clan, who are in-laws with the Thai clan, we can easily suppress the now leaderless regional clans and absorb their militia to form our first army. With this army, we can then secure Xiangyang in the north and Jiangling in the south, and send out your imperial assignment to bring in all eight commanderies of the Jin province under your control. At that time, with the fortifications in Xiangyang, even Yuan Shu would be powerless to stop you from assuming the role as the prefect of the Jin province. Naturally, Liu Bao agreed with Kuai Yue's plan, as without their support, Liu Bao had nothing in the Jin province, aside from a piece of useless imperial assignment document naming him as the new prefect. And soon after, 55 clan militia leaders would arrive in Yicheng, dreaming of receiving official government titles, only to fall into Kuai Yue's trap, as all of them would be ambushed at the feast and killed in cold blood. Leaderless, their militia group soon surrendered to Liu Bao, who had the support of the Kuai, Cai, and Huang clans, who all naturally had their own armed forces as well. So essentially, even though Liu Bao got assigned to become the prefect of the Jin province by Dong Zhuo and the imperial court, what truly secured him this position in reality was his reliance on these three larger local clans, and he used them to suppress and absorb the forces of the smaller local clans, and that brought peace and established control within the Jin province. Afterwards, Kuai Yue would also be the one responsible for convincing Zhang Hu, who was a bandit from Jiangxia, and Chen Sheng, who was a local gentry clan leader from Xiangyang, to surrender the city of Xiangyang to their forces as these two had allied together and taken control of the city of Xiangyang prior to Liu Bao's arrival. Now with Xiangyang under their control, serving as the new administrative center for Liu Bao, Liu Bao would finally make the formal announcement of his appointment as the new prefect of Jin province, and for the most part, the majority of the Jin province commanderies would acknowledge Liu Bao's appointment, but Nanyang, now under the control of Yuan Shu, would refuse. And to find out what Yuan Shu planned to do about Liu Bao's assignment, come back next time, as we'll continue our story from here. Hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more contents like this on Three Kingdoms history, or support the channel by leaving a comment below, or simply hit that like button, as the next episode of this series will drop once this video hits 300 likes. So as always, I'll see you all then. Bye!